much for joining us in this time today, and uh, we're excited about being able to share God's Word with you today. I want to share some quick announcements with you about what's going on here at Sweetwater. Uh, we've, over the last couple of weeks, we have uh, not been in live services due to all the things that have been going on with the uptick in COVID. Uh, but we are thankful that things are better now, and, and um, I'm thankful to be uh, well. It doesn't sound like I am, but they say that I am, and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing well, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your prayers, and uh, we look forward to uh, November the 1st. November the 1st, um, uh, we will be coming back live and, and so uh, be making your plans for that for 1030 on the morning of November the 1st. And then we will have uh, a service on November the 8th at 1030. And then our plans is November the 15th to try to come back with Sunday school and both worship services. So you just be in prayer as, as we are projecting out over the next couple of weeks what we're going to try to do. So be, be in prayer for that. But uh, until then, um, we will be um, sharing uh, the service this morning and then also the service for uh, Wednesday night. Um, of course, we want to continue to pray for those that are dealing with um, the situation with COVID. And we pray for their healing. And then also we have other folks that are dealing with uh, different types of illnesses. We want to continue to pray for one another uh, this morning. And one big thing, of course, is that we want to be praying for our election. And we're right now in the middle of voting already. And uh, if you have not voted, make sure that you vote. If you don't early vote, uh, make sure that you vote uh, on November the 3rd. And we're praying for God to move in a mighty way uh, through this election um, and that, that God's person will be elected. And, um, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask um, uh, God to move in a mighty way during this time. This morning after I pray, uh, then Miss Julie Shoemaker is going to come, and she's going to share a word of music with us today. Father, thank you so much for the chance that we have to be able to spend time in worshiping you and then, Lord, time that we have to be able to look into your word this morning. And I pray that your word will come alive to us. And even I pray, God, that you be with us uh, this morning, even though we're doing this uh, through Facebook, I pray that you would move in a mighty way in our hearts and minds today. And, Lord, you know the needs that are all around us and we pray that um, you would meet those needs, those that are dealing with physical issues, those that are dealing with um, uh, spiritual issues that they have, emotional issues. Lord, we pray for their healing. We pray for cleansing. Um, Lord, we pray that you would defeat this virus in the name of Jesus. And, um, and then, Lord, we pray for our election that's coming up. We pray that through your sovereignty, Lord, that you do a tremendous work. And, Lord, that the right person will be elected. And, Lord, that we as Christians will get out and we'll vote our values. And, and Lord, we know that if we do that, that we'll be able to make a difference. And so, Lord, but we're trusting for you to send revival to our land. Send revival in our midst, we pray, even moving in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide underneath his shadow they that seeketh his face there in the midst he will be also he longs to be you can't you hear the father asking you where is your dwelling place where is your heart 
hearts Do you search to know Him Or are you far apart The Father waits for you And He longs for Tell me where is your dwelling place? Where your treasures lie, there your heart will be. in me so take the time to dwell in his splendor and his grace for blessings are in store if you will but seek his holy face Thank you so much, Miss Julie. We appreciate you sharing that with us this morning. Isn't it the most wonderful thing to be able to know that we have a dwelling place with the Lord Jesus, that we can dwell with him and he desires to dwell with us, and we can have that intimate fellowship with Jesus. And, um, and so I, I'm excited about being able to share with you this morning as we conclude our um, thoughts that we've had over the last few weeks uh, regarding growing up and dealing with adversity, how it is that we can grow through these times. And so um, certainly all of us would have to admit that these, are, these have been times like we've never experienced before. We think about what 2020 has has brought our way what, what we've dealt with individually, what we've dealt with as um, a community, a church, what we've dealt with as far as our nation is concerned. And so um, certainly we need to be um, continuing to pray and lift one another up. But God wants to, to do a work in this time in our life like never before. And so today we're going to be thinking about as we conclude these thoughts on adversity, we're going to be thinking today about growing up through adversity. How is it that we need to grow? What is it that God wants to do in our lives? What should we be thinking about as we go through adversity? What should we be thinking about? How should we be desiring to, uh, uh, to grow through this time? 
And so the first thing I think that we need to note is that we need to be growing in our faith. We need to, to aspire to grow in our faith during the times that we experience. The Lord desires for us to have a greater faith. The Lord desires for us to have a purer faith. Think about the purity of faith that God desires for us to have. Um, as, I, as I think about that, I'm reminded of gold and silver. And I'm thinking about how metal is refined, that gold and silver is heated to an extremely high temperature so that the metal becomes uh, a liquid. And anything that is impure floats up to the top and then we're told that the dross is then skimmed away from the top and the metal becomes pure. The metal is then poured into molds and then it's going to cool and then it becomes bullion that becomes absolutely rare and precious. I want to tell you that I think that that's what God desires to do with our faith. The Lord uses adversity to be able to do that in us. Now, faith can be viewed in, in a couple of ways. Faith can be viewed in when it comes in terms of quantity, and faith can be viewed in terms of quality. When you think about what the Word of God has to say, we're reminded that faith, when it comes to quantity, is referred to, Jesus referred to it many times, is, is how can you have such little faith? Little faith can be described as that God can do it, but he may not. God can do something, but he may not. And then when we're thinking about um, the quantity of faith, we think about great faith. The Bible refers to great faith, that, and, and that can be defined in a way that God can do it, and God will do it. God can do it, and God will do it. And then there's a third kind of faith that is, is, is perfect faith. We think about perfect faith. Perfect faith is, says that God, that God said he would do it, and so it is done. And that kind of faith is expressing is that there's no doubt that God is God in every situation, and God is God in every circumstance of life. Isn't that the most wonderful thing that we can claim through what we're going through right now, that, that we can have a faith that knows and trusts and believes that God is God in the midst of it all. But then also, there are three types of quality faith. Three types of quality faith. One type of quality faith is what we call inherited faith. An inherited faith. An inherited faith is a faith that comes as a result of us seeing God work in the lives of other people. An inherited faith, for instance, for me, would be a faith where I saw God in the life of my parents. I was privileged to be able to grow up in a home that taught us about God. Not only did my parents teach me about God, but they also illustrated that by their example. They illustrated to me who God is. And so we might refer to that as an inherited faith. An inherited faith might also come from someone like uh, your youth leader or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor that you've been able to see in their life faith being acted out, faith being lived. And so as a result of that, you have desired to have that kind of faith. We believe faith works because we have seen faith working in the lives of others. We believe in Jesus because we've had others that have been in our life that have believed in Jesus and they have set for us that example. But then also, we have seen the Word of God and how the Word of God is lived out in the lives of others. I'm reminded of the passage that when Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul spoke to Timothy and says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, 
that first of all dwelt with your grandmother Lois and was also in your mother Eunice, and now I am persuaded, Paul says, it is in you as well. And so Timothy's grandmother and his mother had exhibited this kind of faith, and so Timothy had an inherited faith. And then there is textbook faith. There is textbook faith. Textbook faith can be described, I think, as a faith that, that we get from reading the Word of God, from, from reading what the Bible has to say. So we read the Bible, and we believe what the Bible says to be true. That is a textbook faith. As like the song Jesus Loves Me says, we believe because the Bible tells me so. That is a textbook faith. Now, both of these types of faith, inherited faith and textbook faith, are very important in our life. We benefit greatly. I have benefited greatly. And if you've had this experience yourself, you have benefited greatly through the fact that you have an inherited faith. That you have seen God work in the lives of others, and so you desire for him to work in you. And then you have been blessed, perhaps, to be able to grow up in a Bible-preaching church. And, and you, you grow up in that church. You've been blessed to, to hear Bible-preaching and Bible-teaching throughout your life. But then there's also something called proven faith. Proven faith. And, and that goes to another level. Proven faith is that means that we have tested the principles of the Bible. We have tested the principles of the Bible. We have tested the principles that we have been taught, that, that we have experienced. And we've tested it through the times of adversity. And we realize that our faith is true and our faith is alive, our faith is real. As we've gone through times of adversity, Peter wrote over in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you look there. And by the way, I encourage you for this past Wednesday night study that you make sure, even though we're going through this online right now, that you take out your Bible and that you follow along with me. And many of you are used to taking notes. And, and so I encourage you to continue to take notes. I encourage you to jot down these scriptures. And then when we're through, at some point in time, you go back and you read through these scriptures again. And I'm going to be sharing several scriptures with you this morning. But in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7, this is what Peter wrote. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we use our faith in the midst of adversity, we can trust that God is going to bless that and is going to give us a greater faith. Elijah. Elijah is an example of someone who had a proven faith. Think about the story of Elijah just for a moment. There was a time during a time of famine that God told Elijah, I want you to go to the brook Cherith. Now, you don't find Elijah questioning God. You just find Elijah following and doing what God told him to do. He told him to go to the brook Cherith. And he would experience there while he was at that brook that God would bring meat to him. He would have fresh water flowing from the brook. The meat would be brought to him by ravens. And so every day, when Elijah went about his business there at the brook, he was taken care of. He was trusting in the Lord. He had a proven faith. And that proven faith went on to another level where the brook dried up. Maybe you've had a time in your life where you, and maybe you're feeling that right now, it looks like the brook is drying up and things are, 
uh, more difficult than ever before. And, but God told Elijah, I want you to get up and I want you to go to a place called Zarephath. And there's going to be a widow there. And I want you to go to the widow of Zarephath. And I want you to go to her and I want you to tell her to make you a cake. Make you some bread. And he goes to the woman, the widow. The widow says, when he asks her what you're doing, she says, I'm collecting sticks to be able to have a fire so that I can use the very last of my flour, the very last of my oil to provide for me and for my son, and then we will die because that's all she had. Elijah said because of his proven faith in time of adversity, when he was at, at the brook, he could tell her that God had taken care of his needs. And now he's going to tell her that, that you provide this bread for me. And God is going to provide for me and for you and for your son until the famine is over. And that's exactly what God did. And, and there would be the increasing of faith for Elijah and the increasing of faith for the widow, even to the point that we know later on in that story that the son actually died. And there was going to have to be more of this proven faith because the son has died. And then Elijah, we know, goes into the upper room where the son is, and he literally lays on top of the son and he cries out to God for God to raise up the son and the son is raised from the dead. And so Elijah experienced a proven faith. Now, here's a question that we need to consider is how does adversity purify our faith? How does adversity purify this faith that we've been talking about? Well, the most important thing about your faith and the most important thing about my faith is not the fact that we have faith. You will have people tell you today, just have faith. Man, you just got to have faith. Well, your faith and my faith is only as good as the object of our faith. And for those of us that are believers, those of us that have been saved, the object of our faith that we must place our faith in, our trust in, we must look to is Jesus Christ. Hebrews in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we were surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. As we run the race looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to tell you that as we go through COVID, as we go through all of the distress that's going on in our society, and, and all the struggles, and, and as we, we see the enemy that is fighting, as we come upon the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and we're dealing with all of this adversity I want to tell you that we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith the object of our faith helps to purify our faith faith is only as valuable as its object and Jesus is pure and because Jesus is pure then Jesus can purify our faith as well adversity strips away things from us. Adversity strips away things, everything but Christ in our life. In adversity, what we realize is that nothing satisfies but Jesus. As we're going through all of this, and what, whether it's this that we've been going through over the last year, or it's other things that's going on in your life. you got other things that's going on that's brought more adversity than this virus has for you, perhaps. Or the things that's going on in our society. Adversity strips away everything but Jesus. And what you find is, what I have found is, when I've gone through adversity, is, is nothing is secure except Jesus. Do you know, I think you do, 
Our money can be lost just like that. We can lose our financial portfolio just like that. Money can be gone. Have you noticed in times in your life that friends will desert you? Maybe even a spouse desert you. Our houses can go up in flames. Our marriages may end in divorce. But Jesus, oh, I love that. But Jesus remains. In the midst of adversity, many things can be stripped away. But one thing remains, and that's Jesus. And then also, what should we be aspiring for in the midst of adversity? As believers, we should be aspiring that we would grow in our compassion. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and He is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we will be able to comfort others who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, Paul says, it is for your consolation and for your salvation, which is effective for the enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and it is for your salvation. When we are struck with a certain trial or certain amounts of adversity, we are often amazed at how many others have experienced the same pain. We go through something and then we realize, hey, somebody else has gone through the same thing. They've experienced the same pain. One of the things that happens with us and should happen with us is that we have empathy. When we go through a tragedy, when we go through adversity, we can have empathy for others. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. And man, I want to tell you something. There's nothing more painful than that. That is so, so painful. You've gone through a divorce. Well, you can have compassion for others now who are going through that divorce. You can have empathy perhaps. Maybe, maybe you have yourself been critically ill at some point in time. And now you can relate to those who are critically ill. Or maybe you have a loved one that's been critically ill and you walk through that time with them that you can now be compassionate and have empathy for those that have critically ill family members. Maybe it is that you can have empathy and compassion for those who have lost loved ones. I remember that up until the time that I lost my parents, I'd really never lost anything. Never lost anyone that was that really important to me. When I lost my parents, then I began to have, there was an empathy that came about in my life that I could enter into suffering and, and, and have compassion for those who were dealing with the loss of loved ones. Maybe you have a special needs child and, 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 and you've gone through that adversity and, and are going through that adversity, but that now you can reach out to others who perhaps are going through the same thing. Or maybe it is that God has brought you through and given you victory over an addiction. Praise God, He gives victory over addiction. And you've come through an addiction and you have, have received um, power and authority over it because of what Jesus has done. Now, now you can have empathy and compassion for those who are going through those addictions. So compassion for those it's something that, that, that we need to have it translate into action then that we want to reach out to them and we want to minister to them. But also, as, as a believer in Jesus, I ought to have compassion for those who don't know the Lord. 
You see, because there was a time, there was a time in my life, and if you know the Lord, there was a time in your life when you didn't know the Lord. There was a time in your life that you were separated from him. There was a time in your life that, that you were experiencing heartache and, and adversity that was brought on by sin. There was a time in your life that, that you were dead in your sins, the Bible said. But, but then you came to faith in Jesus Christ and you trusted him to be your Lord and your Savior. You can identify with those that have been lost and because of, of being able to identify with those that have been lost, you can pray for them. You know how to pray for them. You can reach out to them in love. You can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them because you've been there and you now have a concern for their soul. Adversity will either harden us or it will soften us. If we get harder, we're subject to more adversity because we haven't learned. If we get softer, <clears throat> it can lead to greater compassion for other people. Jeremiah 18 you have the story of Jeremiah going to seeing the potter at work. And he watched the potter as the potter would take the clay. And as he was molding the clay, then he would, he would literally crush the clay and begin to remake it. And what God was saying to Jeremiah by what he saw in the potter and the clay is that this is God and Israel. This is God and what he desires to do in Israel. For us, what that means is that God will work us. He will rework us as clay in his hands until we have the traits in our life that he desires us to have. And that remaking so many times is through adversity. Compassion that leads us to prayer. That leads us to generosity. That leads us to more kindness towards others. That leads us to actions that are rooted in love. Peter wrote again in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, he said. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And then one other thing I'll share with you that I think we need to aspire for. As we go through adversity, we need to aspire to grow in ministry. Adversity prepares us for unique ways to be able to minister. I've gone through hard times emotionally. So have you. I feel, I can feel the pain of what a man or uh, you can feel the pain of what a man or a woman feels when they hurt. Now, we are to minister the word of God to them. And in order to minister the word of God to them, we need to know the word and we need to know how the word of God applies. To truly minister to people, we need a proven faith like that of Elijah. We need the compassion that Peter talks about in this scripture that I just read. And the ability to be able to empathize with people's feelings. Adversity prepares me to be able to minister to people, to comfort them, to help them, to encourage them, to trust God's word. But you know what it also does? It gives me the opportunity to offer hope. As a believer in Jesus, as one who knows him as Lord and Savior of my life, I can offer to you hope. In all these dark days, and man, they are dark. I am able to offer you hope when it seems hopeless. I am able to offer to you light in the midst of the darkness because the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. And I can offer that light to you. And if you're a believer, you can offer that light 
to those that don't know Christ. You see, to offer hope enables people to get their focus off their circumstances. Maybe right now today you are a believer, but you, you, you got your eyes on circumstances. And boy, that's easy to do. That's easy to do. I've done it myself. That we get our eyes on our circumstances, but we need to place it, our eyes on eternal things. We need to get our eyes off the storms that rage around us and get our eyes on Jesus. Peter was walking on the water that day to Jesus. The storms raged. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, began to sink. Some of us have taken our eyes off Jesus and what's vitally important, and we're beginning to sink. Now, I want you to know, here's the hope. Here's the hope is that you can cry out to Jesus. You can cry out to Jesus, and he will help you. He will save you. That's the hope that we have in him. Then also, we will not completely understand our suffering. We will not completely understand all of our adversity until we're with the Lord. And you know what he's going to do? Jesus is going to tie up all the loose ends for us. I got a lot of loose ends right now that I don't understand. A lot of loose ends I don't understand. But Jesus is going to tie up all the loose ends. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He will tie up all the loose ends. I want you to also know, you think about it. When Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples, it was only after they had gone through a time of great adversity. The adversity of having seen and experienced the Lord's crucifixion. And then they experienced the power of the resurrection. And then he gave them the great commission. When he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. There are a lot of us that believe, and I'm one of them, that believe we're coming to the end of the age. That today, tomorrow, next week, next year, sometime soon, God's going to call his church to go home. The rapture of the church is going to take place. I believe we're just that close. And he says, I will be with you to the end of the age. But until then, I call you to minister. I call you to share the gospel with others. I call you to make disciples. And yes, even through times of adversity, we can have folks that we can minister to. And as we experience stronger faith, greater compassion, we minister to others through his strength. And we can share with them his strength and the hope that is in Jesus. Will we do that? Will we, will we make the commitment that we want to share the hope of Jesus with others? And what you find about your life then, even in adversity, is our purpose in life is enlarged. When you just feel like the world's coming down on you. But when you trust in the Lord and you grow in your faith, you'll realize that he has a greater purpose for you and for me. I want you to bow your heads right there where you are at home. If you're driving right now while, you, while you're listening to this, perhaps. Maybe you're listening to it on Facebook right now while you're driving. Don't bow your head. But pray. Pray with me right now. Will you pray? Lord, 
Would you use the adversity in my life to prepare me to minister comfort and encouragement and your word to other people? Let's think that again one more time. Lord, use the adversity of my life to prepare me to minister comfort and encouragement and your word to others. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you something. The Lord will always say yes to that prayer. He will always say yes to that prayer. Another prayer that he will always say yes to is the prayer of repentance. A prayer of repentance where you're turning away from your sin. You're asking him, seeking him to forgive you of your sin. Cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. And then you look to him by faith and you ask him to save you, he will always say yes. There's some of you out there right now, you've never trusted in Jesus to be your Lord, your Savior. Right now, would you repent of your sins? Would you ask him to forgive you? Would you trust him by giving your life to him right now? He will say yes. I appreciate you joining us for this time. I look forward to November the 1st when we'll be able to be back together. Join us on Wednesday night as well. I'm praying for you. Looking forward to seeing you soon.